Welcome back, everybody, um, to the second half of the program. I am thrilled to introduce Thad Starner. Thad is a professor in the School of Interactive Computing at Georgia Tech. He's also been the uh, lead for Google Glass. I saw him uh, move his Google Glass up to his head just earlier, but he has not done that since 1993, is what I learned from reading his, uh, from reading his bio. Um, but seriously, we're, we're very excited that that is here. Uh, I got a sneak peek of some of his presentation, which seems very exciting. And that, welcome, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Is this, oh, I have to do this one. Okay, yeah, I can do that. One. So hopefully I can do this without causing bad noises. Everybody can hear me? Excellent. OK, so today I'm going to talk about symbiotic AI. When I started working on wearable computers, I was actually trying to use it as an approach to do artificial intelligence. And so back then, in the early 90s, this was considered a, um, uh, a uh, weird idea, a crazy idea. But nowadays, with machine learning taking off so much, it's now considered uh, uh, acceptable to talk about this sort of thing. Uh, along those lines, I should say I'm speaking now as a professor, not as Google. So everything here is my own, my own opinion. Even if it should be Google's, it's actually mine. So do not quote me as anything but a professor. Um, so I've been wearing machines since 1993. I started out with this machine on, my, uh, on the left here. That was a private eye display with a, a, a 720 by 280 screen on it. Uh, in my hand is something called a Twiddler. It's a keyboard. I can type up to 130 words per minute on that. Um, over the years, the displays have gotten smaller. There's even one that was in the lens of a, uh, a, a pair of glasses. Those are my prescription glasses on the right. That was a time-lapse photo. If you actually looked at, looked at that uh, normally, you would not see the, the display. It would be very hard to see. Um, and of course, now we have Google Glass. Now, along the way, I really believe in creating this thing called living laboratories. That's when we actually create the technology well enough that we can actually use it in our daily lives. So back at MIT, I had a group of people called the Wear Folk who actually wore these things as part of the daily life. There's a picture of them up there. Georgia Tech, we also started a little enclave of folks. At Google, the team actually made their own uh, systems and uh, the, the, that became glass. And we had hundreds of people actually wearing glass internally before we announced in 2012 so they could live, uh, do it externally. 2014, we actually started selling these devices publicly for about nine months. It's the most successful head-worn display computer ever sold. Now, you might ask, I, I noticed all the talks earlier were talking about wireless and, and a lot of machine learning applied to networking, this sort of thing. Well, the wearable community has had a, a really big impact on uh, IEEE and the standards. For example, the IEEE 802.15 standard, which you guys know about as Bluetooth and Zigbee, and now there's a visible light communication version of it. Uh, this started out as the IEEE Ad Hoc Wearable Standards Committee in 1997. This was the uh, effort to actually make a body-sized network to communicate between these different devices. We thought we'd start, we'd start populating your pockets and your wrists and your rings and your head. This was done by Big Dick Braley at FedEx. FedEx announced to me in uh, 1995 that they were going to spend $100 million in the next year to actually equip all their uh, employees with uh, wearable computers. Um, this is after seeing a demo uh, at MIT of my, my work. Um, I told them they were insane, uh, that it was impossible to actually, in 1996, to actually make a wearable computer for their carriers. And they said, what's, what's the problem? Why, why can't we do it now? I said, well, there's, there's lots of things missing. The equipment's not there yet. For example, just a wireless standard to communicate between the different parts, that doesn't exist. And so they came back to me, much to my surprise, and said, so what does it take to make a standard? Well, you go to IEEE and you, you start this process. And the next thing I know, Dick Braley at FedEx is leading the charge to do this 802.15 standard. Um, and Ian Gifford, if you look at Ian Gifford, even Gifford's uh, uh, talks about this sort of stuff, uh, he has some papers that say uh, how this stuff got started. More recently, we, we've, the wearable computing community has led uh, the effort for doing human activity recognition, a lot of the context stuff you're seeing around these days, the automatic discovery of home and work and that sort of thing on Google Maps, and prediction of your de next destination using GPS trails. Uh, that, to my knowledge, first started with the wearables co co community. There's some very large data sets out there uh, done by wearables uh, for 
trying to do human activity recognition and prediction. And if you're interested in doing this sort of stuff, I highly recommend the International Symposium on Wearable Computers, iswc.net. That is a very good place to see the state of the art um, in all things on body. And uh, that's been around now for, I think, 22 years. Here's some of my personal efforts. This is Google Glass. Uh, I am kind of shocked Google allows me to do this. We actually have a traveling museum exhibit where I show lots of wearable computers from the past 30 years, 40 years, um, including all the prototypes of Google Glass. Up in the upper left is the first fully functional version of Glass. That involved a cell phone strapped to the side of my head. That was the only way we could get a touch pad that was multi-touch back then. So uh, that, was, that was trapped to the, to the left side of the head. In the, on the right side was a light eye, tack eye display. There's also earphones, an IMU, a GPS unit, all going down to a backpack full with a, a Google standard laptop and lots of other off-the-shelf equipment. Um, from there, we started tearing apart cell phones um, using uh, uh, projectors. Um, so if you've ever seen these little projectors you can buy that are, are travel projectors, very small things, right, that can, can throw about 200 lumens on, on the wall. We took one of those apart, actually took many of those apart, and used the projector heads to actually use as displays. The problem is they have a very small eye box. It's very hard to see them well as you're moving about because they shift too easily. So in order, in order to do that, we actually had to um, uh, make safety glasses per person. Uh, that included measuring the person where the person's eye was, taking a, a Dremel tool you know, and just cutting out a hole. And then while the person is sitting there looking at the display, hot gluing it to the display. This really made me nervous when uh, Sergey asked for his first uh, system. Sergey is one of the co-founders of Google. So I see Sergey Brin with my former undergrad from MIT uh, like this with a hot glue gun at his eyeball. So uh, I just had to leave the room. Um, I, I couldn't take that. My nurse couldn't take it. But fortunately, Josh's uh, hands are much better than mine are. Over, the, over time, it got smaller and lighter. Uh, we use an optics design by Mark Spitzer from Micro Optical Corporation until we get down to the Glass XE, which was sold from, uh, until January 2015. And then from, January, from 2015 to the present, we were selling the Enterprise Edition of Glass. Most people don't realize that. Uh, so this whole thing of Glass returning, Glass never went away. Um, it was being sold quietly to industry from 2015 till now. It's an industrial experiment, just like uh, glass was an experiment, trying to see what people would do with it. Now, um, AI, as it turns out, uh, has always been part of wearable computers. Um, a lot of people who did wearable computers were computer vision folks, uh, pattern recognition folks, machine learning folks. And uh, this is my colleague, Tony Jabara. He uh, spent some time with me making a system called Stochastics. Yes, so stochastics, S-T-I-C-K, yeah, okay, anyways. Um, the, <laughs> to play pool. So the idea was you actually put on a headset that has a camera on it. It would actually analyze the pool table uh, using computer vision, figure out what shots are best given your prior background, and then uh, help, you, help you align your shot. Now, I have a little video of this. Now, remember, this is like circa 1997 or so, so don't expect really good graphics here. Um, Oops, I actually want to go to the next one here. All right, if you want to be one of the best pool players in the world, My apologies. but don't want to practice, not a problem. An idea right out of science fiction could one day help you play better than anybody on the planet. New York Bureau Chief and Pool Shark Rick Lockridge has tonight's hot click. Sometimes what seems like science fiction is just waiting for a lucky break. I was watching this show, Quantum Leap, and there's this holography thing that is helping the, the main character play pool. I said, we can build that. So Tony Jabara of the Machine Learning Lab at Columbia University set out to design a laptop and lipstick camera rig that would calculate the shot with the best odds of success, line that shot up for you, and update itself 30 times per second. And show you virtual lines on top of a pool table, just like that science fiction show. But could it turn an average player into a sure enough hustler? Can you see through this play? League night at Brooklyn's Park Slope Billiards. Rack them up for some beta testing. I'm looking at the pluses, right? Yeah. If you can practice enough, 
to get that coordination down to where you're realizing you're using a real cue ball in a virtual world. Sure. Got to be helpful. At the beginning, I felt weird with that one because they... It's just weird, but um, at the end, I, I like them. They're a lot of fun. The American Pool Players Association is interested in the $3,000 system for practice only, of course. The initial hurdle is to get people... <laughs> you get the idea. The embarrassing thing here is it actually improves my game. <laughs> I'm that bad a player. Um, okay. So that was kind of an early version of, of using AI as par of wearable computers, doing this computer vision system. Uh, more recently, we're doing stuff with order picking. So this is actually a deployed system, uh, not exactly what you see here, but this is deployed by a company called UBMAX using Google Glass. And the idea here is to help people pick inventory from large warehouses. So about tr a trillion dollars worth of goods are picked from about a million, dollars, a million different warehouses every year. Most of those items are picked by hand. So next time you order for something from Amazon, think about somebody who, uh, walking down the aisles, actually picking the different parts to fulfill your order. The same sort of warehouses are used for assembling cars. As the cars are coming up the assembly line, there's somebody going through 1,000 different parts by 100 different vendors, walking down 20-meter pick lines, uh, and they are picking for six to eight cars at a time, the next six or eight cars coming down the assembly line. And for a company like BMW, almost every car is different. You, know, don't you, say, you might go weeks before you see the same model car come through. So um, the same exact trims and everything. So this is very much a thing where you really want to have good accuracy. If you don't have good accuracy, you can stop the assembly line, which costs you thousands of dollars a second. So the idea here is we can actually make a system that uh, helps us help the pickers figure out what they need to pick and do it efficiently. So this is what you see in the display. There's a little display in Google Glass, unlike what you see in the press. In Google Glass, the, the display is actually centrally located and high in your visual field. And so it shows you where to pick next. And, it's, and what you're doing is creating a little AI to optimize where you pick and when. In this case, we're going to have the person pick with both hands. And the most recent version of this thing has RFID bands on the wrists, so it confirms the pick as they reach in. This turns out to be the most efficient system out there. It beats pick by light and all these other systems by far. So let me show you a little video of what that looks like. So this is a novice picker. Um, what we're just showing here is a difference between a transparent and opaque glass. Um, but what, uh, you notice that the um, shelves are color-coded to help people uh, pick correctly. And here we're just picking for three cars at a time. So this is an emulated pick, uh, uh, pick situation in my laboratory that uh, is supposed to simulate what happens on these car assembly lines. But you get the idea. Here's a more experienced picker. You can see they're doing both hands at the same time. Having the display up high enables them to actually sort of pipeline their picks. And when you actually get good at this, it's very, it's very um, satisfying, actually. It's surprising, satisfying. It's like, um, uh, it's like a ballet. And you're very skilled at it. And you can go for many hours doing this. And you kind of get into the zen, zen uh, uh, feel of it. Um, OK, so that is an example of using AI techniques for just simple path planning and optimization. Um, here's, a more, here's something you might have seen more uh, uh, in, the, in, the, um, uh, in the press. Uh, with Google Glass. This is a way to translate signs uh, from English or Spanish or French to another language. In this case, we're actually using, uh, uh, doing English to Spanish, I believe. And uh, you can see that it's recognizing the video and translating it to the other language automatically. And if you, if you really want to, you can actually use your head motion to pull the display in line with what you're looking at so it actually gives you an overlay effect. You know, the way to do augmented reality is oftentimes not with sophisticated computer vision, but give the user the ability to do the overlay themselves. So again, this is something that used to be very, very hard to do back when I was in school. Something like this would take a, a high-end supercomputer. Uh, these days, you can actually do it all on board this device here. Here's another interesting thing we're starting to do, see with AI, um, and that is 
helping uh, doing speech recognition uh, and using it for very interesting uh, 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 applications. In this case, this is Jim Foley. Uh, Jim is uh, one of the computer graphics uh, famous professors out there. If any of you have studied computer graphics, you probably use the Foley and Van Damme computer graphics book. It's that big one that everybody has on their shelves. Um, Jim Foley has been losing his hearing over the years. And he has two hearing aids that he, uh, he uses. Um, but one of the things he does is he uses a lot of context and looking at your face to understand what you're saying. So we decided to actually try to do speech transcription for him on Google Glass so that if he misses something, he can look up and see it quickly. So he might say to him, hey, Jim, can we meet February 3rd? He can see the February on your lips because it's a long word, has a lot of uh, lip motion. But third, he might not be able to see. And so he can glance up, get the word he missed, and get right back to the conversation. So in many senses, this is a way to aid people who are deaf and hard of hearing have normal communication. So let me show you what that looks like. Start captions. Hey, Jim. How's it going? Great, Jay. How are you today? Pretty good. I had a question about the classes you teach. I wanted to know if I could help you at all with the class. Oh, what a great offer. In fact, I'd like to show off Google Glass and this application to class. How long have you been teaching here at Tech? Uh, Jay, I've been teaching here since 1991, about 22 years ago. I gotta head out right now, but I'll see you in class. All right, super duper, thanks. Bye bye. So I learned a couple of things from doing this work with Jim and Jay there. Well, number one is that speech recognition really is getting good enough that you can do this sort of interaction. The second thing I learned is never to use professors and students for demonstrations, because they're pretty wooden. Um, <laughs> but um, one of the things we're seeing with this sort of, these sort of devices, with these wearables, is that suddenly we can actually do a combination of AI locally. We're doing speech recognition, some of that speech recognition, locally on device. So all the control phrases are done here. But all the free-form text is done in the cloud. And so you can go back and forth uh, between cloud and local processing uh, for your AI techniques and get uh, a pretty seamless interaction. It's, a matter of fact, surprisingly good if you actually see somebody using this. Um, uh, you wouldn't really feel like the conversation is being interrupted uh, by the captioning. And of course, this was done in 2014. Uh, the, the software has gotten a whole lot better since then. OK. So now let me talk a little bit about augmented memory. Um, back when I first started wearable computers, uh, I started my wearable computer, I was a student at MIT. And I found that I could either pay attention to the lecture or get an intu and get an intuition of the lecture, or I could take good notes. But I couldn't do both. I studied the Cornell note-taking method. I studied you know, all these different ways of being efficient in your note-taking, and none of them were very good for me. Right? So uh, uh, you know, I would find when doing computer vision with um, uh, Horn that uh, I could write down all the matrices, um, but I'd never actually understand it. Or if I just paid attention to what he's writing on the blackboard, uh, I would get the intuition for all about you know, two hours, and then I'd lose it and not have any notes for it. So I determined to try and make a way to fix this. And the way to do that, it turned out, was not by using a laptop, which sped up my typing, and I could type in LaTeX really quickly to get the math. But that still caused me to change my focus of attention and my physical focus of my eyes from the blackboard back to the laptop and back and forth. And this didn't really work very well. But when I got a head-up display like this one, I could actually put the text I was writing on the blackboard in front of me. And that allowed me to take fast, high-quality notes and still get an intuition for what the person was saying. And this is using that one-hand Twitter keyboard I was talking about before. Now, what's interesting about this is I found that it wasn't just useful in classrooms. When you're at a university, you might be across the, the, the lunch table from a Nobel Prize winner. And so you really want to take good notes while you're, you're talking with them. And so I found that having the head-up display allowed me to take good notes while talking with somebody famous. In this case, this is Alan Alda, who you might remember from the movie MASH, or the, the TV series MASH. Turns out if you ever get interviewed by him, he's wonderful. 
Uh, he's a very smart guy. And so I'm taking notes here uh, as we're talking. And what we made is something that actually listens to what I'm typing, or later on, listens to what I'm saying and pulls up files from my past, emails and papers, and things that might be relevant to the current conversation. We call this thing the remembrance agent. So I suddenly had all those notes I've been taking over the, all, all the years. I could suddenly operationalize them in my daily conversation. And all I needed was a good system that had pretty good recall, and it worked very well. Now, humans have bad recall. We have, we have uh, uh, really good recognition. We're, we recognize when something's uh, pertinent, but we're very bad at actually pulling up all the files that are relevant to our current conversation. This is a way we can actually combine the AI techniques, the AI um, um, recall ability with the human memory to actually pull up things and make our conversations better. I'll give you an example. Um, so I had a student who was very interested in speech recognition. And I said to him one day, hey, hey uh, Ben, if you really want to do speech recognition and wearables, you really should go see, and I'm, I'm now I'm pulling up the notes uh, on my display, you really should read Steve Whitaker's paper called PhiloChat from Kai 1995. In it, he says that up to 93% of our conversations are serendipitous. And the people who are higher up the, the chain, the higher level managers, spend more of their time in spoken conversation than the technicians low level. And I can give them all the specific details while I'm talking to them. What's great about this is it makes me appear smarter than I am. This is great when you're a professor, right? Appearing smarter than you are is, 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 is a good goal. Um, so having the computer provide that information just in time as I need it was very useful. The other part of this is actually having, taking the notes in, taking the information I need in as I go. And this has actually become commercialized by a company called Augmetics. They're using Google Glass, uh, you know, this is now 25 years later, they're using Google Glass to actually help doctors take notes. I don't know if you've ever been to a doctor's office and they pay more attention to the laptop than to you, right? They're saying they're typing away, looking into electronic records, and it turns out 40% of their day is spent dealing with electronic health records, and they hate this. By actually having a system that automatically takes those notes, automatically provides that information, uh, we can actually reduce the amount of time doctors spend on electronic health records from 40% to 4%. And they love this, and so do their patients. This company, Augmetics, I think has the right idea. Right now, they're using a live person on the other end of the line, so to speak, to actually help the doctor and provide the information she needs. But I find this very compelling. Let me show you the video and think about how you might use AI to uh, make stuff even faster or better than what we're currently seeing with the live scribe. The most rewarding part of being a primary care physician is the relationship that we have with our patients. It was love at first sight, I'll tell you. <laughs> it's pretty tough. First we hug. Very unprofessional, but I love it. There was a time when I was not doing so well, and she called me home to check up on me. You'll get through this. And it really, it really touched me. Glass, can you pull up the healthcare maintenance for Micah? I see that you're overdue for a couple blood tests, nothing that's true. Class allows us to stay in the moment. Do you tend to feel a little, I'm going to be a little nauseous. It clicked with me when she wasn't sitting at the computer all the time. But no sign of symptoms. She was really able to look me in the eye, and that made it a lot easier for us to interact. A couple more deep breaths for me. <gasps> it's a service called Augmetics. If we need information, it's brought to us. We don't need to go to the computer to get it. Last, could you pull up what I said about her thyroid nodule from last year? Yeah, so it's completely unchanged from last year. It's hard for patients to remember everything that we told them to do. As things are being said, notes are being created live in real time. Here's your after visit summary. Here were your vitals from today. In the past, almost a third of my day was spent with my computer. Now I spend maybe one to two minutes per patient. Since she has the Google Glass, she is not as rushed, honestly not as rushed. Uh, my middle son is going to be Santa again. His Glass gives us a little bit more time to interact and get to know our patients. Okay, let me take a look. Yeah. Oh, there you are. Oh. That's what makes the job really fun. Okay. So, 
one of the things we can also start doing is look at not just having a, a glass or wearable computers help individuals, but we can actually use AI to identify procedures being done by teams of people, helping keep them on track. This is some work done by Paul Lukowitz, my uh, uh, colleague over in Germany, where he's looking at teams of nurses trying to respond to emergency situations where they have to bring in the crash cart and try to do CPR. Um, in particular, as, as we watch this, uh, you'll see that the computer is trying to identify uh, both where they are in the procedure, suggesting when they might actually get uh, extra help, um, and trying to make sure they follow protocol. Now, you'll see little alerts coming up. What they have on them besides glass, so they also have wristwatches. And the wristwatches are monitoring the compressions for the CPR, so they know when somebody's getting tired or when the depth is not deep enough. Um, it's also trying to identify from the telemetry in the room what's going on to help this team of nurses re revive this patient. Now, we can't show you a real patient, of course, uh, but we're actually showing you this on a dummy. So now it's detecting activities that look like CPR, and so it's now monitoring the CPR to make sure we're getting enough, uh, enough compressions and deep enough compressions. It sees that the patient's uh, in uh, cardiac arrest uh, and warns them they need to actually set, set off the alarm so that people know what's going on. Um, it came in this morning um, with um, a headache and flu-like symptoms. Um, okay. um, she's dropped 56 over 24. He's got a temperature of 38.5. He's got a rash on his chest. We're clearly in meningitis. Okay, so he came in with flu-like symptoms, rash on his chest, pyrexial. Um, I don't know if anybody's ever had to do CPR, but it gets tiring very quickly. Just now. Just now. Okay. By the way, uh, if you ever do do CPR, everybody's worried about breaking ribs. Don't worry about it. They're going to die otherwise. <laughs> everybody's afraid to do CPR. This is one of the things we find with people trying to do CPR in emergencies. Everybody's afraid to start it. They're going to die otherwise. A couple of broken ribs, they'll thank you for afterwards. Just do it. <laughs> um, uh, it's, it's again and again we see people are afraid of doing this. OK, so going further, uh, we can start actually looking at using um, augmented reality and artificial intelligence uh, to help people with visual appearance, impairments. Here, what we're doing again is using Wizard of Oz systems. We're actually reaching out to the crowd and actually using humans to act as the computer vision system for people who, need, who are, have visual impairments who need to figure out the things that are going on in the environment. For example, uh, Jeff Bigham, who did this original system, uh, he had a system where people could take pictures of what they needed to, to, to work on and um, uh, uh, somebody in the crowd would get back to them in as little as 30 seconds. This is important when you actually have, or you're shopping, and you're saying, you know, you have an allergy to nuts, and you want to actually see whether or not the ingredients of this can have nuts in them. Um, or uh, I think the, the, the most shocking one to me is when uh, somebody sent a picture of their pregnancy test to the cloud and said, am I pregnant? Because this is not something you want to ask your neighbor to you know, help you with, right? They're much more happy saying it anonymously to the crowd. So let me show you a video of that. In this video, we test open glass with two visually impaired users. 
First, we show question answering, where a user asks a question and receives an answer from Mechanical Turk or Twitter, and the answer is read aloud. Share with? Open glass. What is this box saying on it? Okay, glass. Share with? Open glass. What is this a can of? Press it. Go. Okay, glass. Share with? Open glass. Tap. Okay. Speak. What is this box? Tap. Yeah, so forward and then double tap. Yeah. Um, that worked, right? I'm sorry I can't hear that. So glass has a bone conducting transducer here. And what that does is it uses your skull as the speaker. So the vibration goes along your skull into your cochlea, bypassing your eardrum. So it keeps it a little bit more private than if you had a, a speaker there. And it keeps your ears clear so you don't have to have earbuds. Um, so, so it's very hard to hear it uh, when you're doing filming like this. Another thing that they're doing now is trying to do... Next, uh, we demonstrate this, memento. We're excited. Uh, they're trying to leave notes in the environment for people who have low vision to actually follow directions. user associates objects and scenes with annotations. A visually impaired user is then read the annotations in real time. A native application streams images to the server where they are matched. Any matches are then sent back to the glass where the text is read back to the user. Memento. These are the power tools. See Sean Kane for information. These are two 3D printers. On your left is Andromeda, and on your right is Enterprise. This is the laser cutter. Be careful. So I don't know if you are hearing that again, but uh, as he's lining up, He's actually hearing those annotations played as it recognizes the different things in the environment. These are two 3D printers on your left is Andromeda, on your right is Enterprise. This is the laser cutter, be careful. Right over here, uh -huh. by me. Open right here. And you're going to stand right, right about here, so you want to turn around. Okay? And um, right over here where I am, you're going to look right towards this. See these tools? So look right. These are the see shanky information. Yeah, so it's recognizing. So it's reading what's in front of you right now? And it's a see shan for information. Exactly. So here we're actually going from the Wizard of Oz thing that um, Jeff and uh, Brandon did originally to actually having a computer vision recognition system that's providing annotation on the real world depending on what you're, you're seeing at the time. Now, what can this help with? Well, if you have low vision, you know, trying to navigate is difficult, especially when you're on, uh, in a big area. Knowing how to set the temperature on your oven is difficult, especially if you're traveling, or even knowing what you're cooking with can be a problem. The, uh, the problem with the first person, per there's also a problem here with the first person perspective. Oftentimes the first images that come over are not very good. The, the, the wrong side of the box is there or it's out of frame. And so basically what you really want is a system that helps provide some sonification, some, some indication when the person has it in the right field of view and then send that image over or then do the recognition on it. Um, but all this stuff that I've been telling you so far is sort of practical, well, in some senses, practical applications of AI that we can do now. But I see a, a much bigger vision that we can do with wearable computers, and that's actually trying to get human-level artificial intelligence. Now, when I mean that, when I say that, I mean getting something that actually understands how to interact with the world. Now, Rod Brooks, when he started talking about embodied cognition, said that, a lot of our intelligence are, is based in the world. 
The reason we know how to work how, what a doorknob is, because it's always at the, about the same height, has the same sort of affordances like twisting or pushing or pulling. And we've encoded a lot of knowledge into the artifacts around us. We know what a chair is. We know what a cup is. We know what a knife and fork are. Um, so Rod would say that until we actually give computers the same hands, uh, the same manipulators, the same sensors that we have, we're not going to get an intelligence we can relate to. If a, if a uh, internet router became intelligent suddenly, we wouldn't know it was intelligent because it only would talk TCP IP. What we really want is something that can actually interact in the human world. And Rod's approach was to make this thing called COG. This was a life-size robot that had cameras where, is, where our eyes are, microphones where our ears are, had motion sensors in the hands. It could sit there and actually train COG to do things. I just tried to teach it how to fence. I did a little fencing at, uh, in a grad school. Um, but the problem is that COG was actually bolted to a table. And so he did not actually get much um, interaction like you would with a child. When, a, uh, when parents have a baby, they spend a lot of time talking to it, showing it things, having it learn how to use its arms and its eyes. There's a lot of spoon-fed information given to that baby. Nobody's going to do this to this 500-pound robot. But what we can do instead is we actually put, with wearable computers, we can put cameras next to our eyes. We can put microphones next to our ears. We can put motion sensors on our hands. We can actually even do brain-computer interfaces. We can start looking into the black box and seeing what our intentionality was. We now have the ability for the first time to actually make decent, decently wearable systems that allow us to actually see the world in human terms from this first-person perspective. I'll give you, and then what we need is some algorithms that can actually look at all that data so, and actually try to figure out what the fundamental units of interaction are. Here's an example. This is from human activity recognition. So suppose I actually have like a, a wrist-worn sensor, like a smartwatch, and it's just getting the, the six axes of uh, the acceleration, X, Y, Z, and the gyro, pitch, roll, and yaw. And that's what you see there. And this is one of my students doing an exercise routine. That's the, there's one exercise routine in the, uh, uh, in the white there. And then there's 32 different iterations of that exercise routine down below. And given this raw data, without any information about what the data is, we made an algorithm that had 97% accuracy. It, it, it discovered the fundamental units here, which were these fundamental exercises, these six exercises he was doing, and actually then labeled them. So going from, this is unsupervised, completely unsupervised learning. Because the human has a lot of repetition and because we have human level motion, we can actually uncover these fundamental units and actually use them in our uh, uh, to, to uh, uh, help understand human interaction. We do the same thing with sign language. Here we're using computer vision, this case from a wearable camera. This was 500 sign phrases with a fully signed vocabulary. The same algorithm that did the exercise data recovered 23 of the 40 signs in this vocabulary, and in, in part, some of the grammar as well. Here's a work from Darnell Moore. He's starting to identify objects not by how they look, but how you use them. If I try to identify a book, right, any book, it's very hard because the book may have different colors on it, different covers on it. We can't really judge the book by its cover, right? We have to actually understand what a book is by how you use it. But if, look, if you look at human motion interacting with the book, it's turning the pages. That's what makes a book. And so you look for that interaction. You look for that motion. And now you know that's a book. You can do the same thing with um, uh, drinking or making coffee. Matter of fact, for these higher level grammars, we can under start starting under understanding things like making coffee or making a peanut butter sandwich. We can actually take computer vision, raw computer vision and raw motion and start understanding uh, doing, uh, start understanding the world around us, starting understanding objects and how they interact with each other. This is work by Al Alariza Fathi and Jim Ray at uh, Georgia Tech. Here he's actually just watching procedures of people making coffee. And uh, he just segments out the region of stuff that's moving, which are basically the hands, and anything that moves in the environment, which means the hands move it. So in this case, it's the coffee grinds. And so we can actually look at how the different hand actions um, uh, changed the object in the environment. So this is a situation where you're opening a coffee jar. And through that, he actually started looking at these sort of bags of objects and actions. So making a cheese sandwich involves cheese and bread and a knife 
and um, uh, uh, particular actions about you know buttering the bread, whereas making coffee involves a spoon and the coffee um, uh, coffee uh, the Folgers coffee cup and a cup and uh, particular actions. Peanut butter sandwich is very similar to a cheese sandwich, but uses peanut butter instead. And by using the same sort of bag of words trick that we use in uh, AI over and over again, we can do that from this first person standpoint and start making agents that start understanding the world around us from our viewpoint. Matter of fact, one of my colleagues has started looking at uh, taking these activities, these motion sensors, and mapping them onto uh, humanoid robots. Can we actually take these activities and how we work with the world and actually use that to train up a, a, a ro real robot that can work in our world? So this is what I like to call for this idea of a symbiotic AI. Can we actually use a big data approach to getting lots of personal data from these on-body sensors and then start looking at progressively hard, more difficult problems, going from exercise to, um, uh, to sign language, to uh, making sandwiches, to understanding, say, operating procedures. Um, and then we can actually start using this data to create useful and usable agents that leverage this AI to actually help us in our daily lives, provide us, remind us when we're doing the wrong step during a, a surgery, remind us when we're doing something that violates the safety protocols and say, changing a tire, or providing the information we need as we need it, say the next instruction for changing a tire. This is where I think we uh, uh, need to go with this stuff, this first person viewpoint. I think it's a, a way to take our, our advantage now, we're having machine learning, and actually make it useful in the real world as opposed to actually being restricted to images on the web. Thank you very much. Um, it's still being sold. There is the Enterprise Edition. Um, and so company like, companies like Augmetics and Agco, UB Max, um, uh, a lot of these folks are actually still buying them. But you have to buy them in like terms of 100 at a time. Uh, so it's, it's hard for individuals to buy, buy it. Um, and it's really doing these industry, um, industry applications, seeing how industry is going to go with it. Um, any other questions? I have one in the front. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Uh, thank you for the interesting talk. So in that example of um, classifying workouts mm -hmm. you gave, uh, I understand that the initial part is actually a clustering where you identify the six exercises, yep. but you still need human labeling, right? In no. the end, because the, how would the AI know what's a dumbbell row or does it need to know it? So suppose I, you know, the problem with a Fitbit, right, is that um, it's, it's uh, very hard to actually get to even just understand a step, because you have to try and make a user independent model. But suppose I have uh, this device in your wristwatch, and it just looks at your data over time, your, your exercise routines, and it starts realizing you're doing, you know, uh, class one 10 times uh, this, uh, uh, this time. And then that's your user routine. And then um, the, the particular exercise routine, you only have done eight so far. It could say, come on, only two more, right? Or it can actually track how many times, you know, as you increase the number of repetitions, uh, it can actually track that over time. So even without knowing what the things are named, um, it can do a pretty good job of actually giving you tracking of uh, how your performance goes for that exercise routine over time. Now, what's cool about this is suppose you have multiple people wearing these things and somebody does provide you uh, some information as a bicep curl, right? Now you can actually use all that data from user independent data uh, to actually label that person's data even though they didn't give the data themselves. Right? So you can do this social filtering approach. So there's some stuff you can do without labeling, some stuff labeling helps you with. So I have a question. Sure. Uh, uh, so, uh, do off-the-shelf AI techniques work pretty well already for the, you know, I mean, you had a, uh, you had very exciting new applications, mm -hmm. 
but my question is about the methods. Do we need to make new methods for yes. your applications, or do uh, existing techniques work? No, existing and techniques don't work very well. The problem with uh, you know, no, you think about k-nearest neighbors or any sort of clustering techniques, they're mostly done in static things, like static images. We're talking about stuff that has an inherent dynamic time warp in that the speed of them changes and doesn't change consistently over time. The way I do a bicep curl is different than the way you do bicep curl. The way I do a bicep curl when I'm, I'm tired is very different than when I start out fresh. And so this becomes not just MP-hard, but nastily MP-hard. And so you really need to do something like um, symbolic aggregate approximation and PAA uh, to get things down to a sort of symbolic level. And then you start doing things uh, like what we're doing for motif discovery. And from there, you do a mixture of motifs and even mixture of rules and grammars so you can actually recognize stuff. What we've gone, our, our hardest thing right now is I'm working with Denise Herzing in the Wild Dolphin Project. And we have 33 years of dolphin vocalizations and visual behavior. And what we're trying to do is find, discover the fundamental units of dolphin uh, communication. Um, and that, of course, is we have no answer, right? And all we got to do is try, try to provide her classes and say, are these interesting? Do these correspond to something interesting the dolphins were doing at the time? Um, and of course, you know, that's incredibly hard because you got a lot of noise and a lot of variation. But it turns out dolphins have names. And you can recognize the names. Um, and we're starting to actually use the acoustics to predict visual behavior as well. So this stuff is beginning to work, but you know the current stuff like LSTMs and this other type of stuff, they're not, it's not really there yet for this unsupervised learning technique. It's a lot of stuff to do yet. Maybe one uh, last question. Yeah, is it possible to make your device become a contact lens? It's very hard to do that. Physics is not your friend on that one. Uh, DARPA had some research that could make a contact lens to a camera, um, and that worked. And um, there's, there's things where you can combine uh, displays with um, the contact lens, but it's hard to get anything into focus at that near distance. You can do a few characters. Just about, that's about it right now. Thank you very much, folks. Thanks very much. Let's thank our speaker again.